And uh, we're a good place to get technologists and environmentalists, students, uh, students and uh, citizen, citizen scientists together uh, because they have a lot of common interests. Certainly lots of uh, uh, environmental researchers would like to use more technology in their research. And uh, lots of technologists and engineers would like to help uh, environmentalists, but they often speak a different language and uh, have a different mindset. So uh, we try to get those people together and uh, see what happens. Um, so uh, I got involved in, uh, with uh, Nerds for Nature about a year and a half ago uh, because I was involved in a local park group uh, called Save a Clarence Park, and we were trying to understand what plants and animals were in the park. So we uh, looked at uh, all kinds of research, went to the Native Plant Society, we went to the Audubon Society, we went to the park, and uh, finally after all the way around and looking through spreadsheets and old uh, field logs, uh, we figured out that there were about 250 species in this park. Uh, we were pretty excited about that, but uh, we didn't know where they were, we didn't know what they looked like, we didn't know if they were even still there anymore, because a lot of them had been uh, uh, noticed just a decade ago. So about that time, I got a call from uh, another uh, nature nerd who said, would you like to do a bioblitz in McLaren Park? I said, sure, what's a bioblitz? And uh, so he explained that uh, it uses uh, uh, some software called iNaturalist. This is open source software developed by a nature nerd named uh, Kenichi Ueda. And um, iNaturalist is a really, really cool software because it lets you use your iPhone to uh, take pictures of plants and animals that you see, and then there's a social network online of other naturalists that help you figure out what it is that you're looking at. So anyone who's uh, seen a wildflower or a bird and you take a picture of it and you post it on Flickr and say, hey, does anybody know what this is? Well, iNaturalist took that and uh, made a really nice uh, software package out of it. So as you can see, uh, you can uh, take pictures of things, you can also research species, uh, it's because you're using your smartphone, uh, Everything is geotagged with a GPS location, right? So you know where you found it. So it's kind of like a flash mob for nature. Everybody shows up in the park uh, on a nice afternoon. Uh, they use their iPhones, take pictures of things, uh, and then uh, try to figure out what it does that they saw. Uh, and the really cool thing is you don't need to know anything about what you're looking at. Uh, you can focus on what, what's interesting. Uh, that's a cool wildflower. That's a weird looking plant. Uh, and you take a picture of it. Uh, so this is one of the pictures I took of a uh, wildflower called blue-eyed grass. But uh, uh, here's a few more pictures of things that we found, uh, that, uh, some that we knew about, some that we didn't. Uh, that's pretty amazing right there. Humber skipper butterflies, uh, weird-looking moths, scary-looking spiders, really scary-looking spiders. And uh, all of this is in our park, right, to, right out of that park. So we were just thrilled to see all of them. Uh, and uh, in the three hours that we had this first bio blitz, we discovered, anyone want to see how many uh, species we discovered there? 239 species we found in an afternoon. Uh, that blew my mind. It's still blowing my mind. Um, so we had so much fun, we said, let's do it again. We went to Fort Princeton, uh, and we found uh, some more amazing uh, species, uh, butterflies and dolphins and hawks. Uh, and uh, that one went just about as well. We found, uh, uh, how many is that? 143 species in an afternoon. Uh, then we went down to the same again. We found just uh, every time we went, we just saw so many amazing things. Uh, we, we look at National Geographic and we look at NOVA and we look at all these things and we say, look at all those exotic species over there. Well, we got some more exotic species right here in the Bay Area. So um, we continued doing bio blitzes. Uh, we went down to Palo Alto and uh, found some cool things down there. And uh, then we went to Lake Barrett. That was a really awesome bio blitz. We had almost 200 people. And uh, we found uh, even more wondrous and uh, awesome things. Uh, the monarch butterfly was especially exciting to see. Everyone knows that they. Uh, migrate from uh, way up north to way down south every year. And uh, we saw one right here at Lake Merritt. Uh, then we went to Chrissy Field and, uh, and found even more amazing things. And uh, the species count looks kind of low there, only 150. But that's because it was pouring rain all day. And we still found 150 species. Uh, then we went to Tilden Park up in the Brinkley Hills. 
and found a very weird fruit bug and uh, some pretty weird mushrooms and a coyote. Uh, just up on the Berkeley Hills. And we were back to San Francisco and found even more exotic species right here in our backyard. So uh, we, uh, about, uh, I think, nine biobots that we've done in the last year. We found 8,000 observations, 1,500 confirmed species, and about 40 participants in the event. So what, you might say? Well, the really amazing thing about iNaturalist is that your observations uh, have impact from personal to global. Uh, for myself, I can keep my life list. Every, every plant and animal I've ever seen, I've got a nice list. A list uh, keep it in your browser. It's pretty awesome. Uh, it also lets me learn about what I've seen or what I think I've seen. So it pulls in data from Wikipedia and from other observations. You can see on the right, you can look at everyone else's uh, pictures of uh, vermilion flycatchers. And um, then down at the bottom, you can see the, the, uh, the zone map. So if you see an animal that's outside of its uh, expected region, uh, maybe there's something funny going on. Uh, this data, the same data that was all gathered from your iPhone can also be uh, collated into a park uh, guide. And so anyone that's visiting the park can say, what's here and where would I find it? Uh, and this is something that you can see on your smartphone when you're in the park. So that's the local uh, angle. And then uh, as you go up in uh, scope, uh, this is uh, McLaren Park on the left you see there, and uh, some of the observations that we found there. Over on the right, you'll see uh, candlestick mark. Now, what do they call a candlestick now? Anyway, it's not going to be there much longer. Uh, there's a huge housing development going in there. So uh, iNaturalist might be the kind of tool that you can use to see change over time in an area where uh, development and construction is going on. And then regionally, uh, you can see the observations uh, of iNaturalist here in the uh, Bay Area. And uh, half of them are there are from major bio blitzes. Others are from uh, other bio blitzes that other groups have done. So um, this lets us track uh, regional ecosystems and get an idea of what's happening uh, in the whole area. And then, of course, globally, the impact is uh, tremendous because most of these species migrate, some of them quite large distances, and uh, this data lets us help keep track of what's migrating where and when. Uh, so. Uh, this is maybe the biggest way that we uh, can leverage uh, open source technology and uh, to my mind is really a model uh, for uh, other projects that we might want to do in the citizen science community because uh, just a little bit of data that you take into your iPhone uh, has impact in many different ways. So now I'm going to talk about another project that we've worked on called Change Brackets. And this is just... Uh, a way to use crowds uh, to develop time-lapse movies uh, for ecological research. It was inspired by a fellow at USGS called Sam Drogi, and uh, we added uh, a social media element so that uh, we can now uh, turn park visitors into a remote sensing network. Uh, we have a pilot project on Mount Diablo, where last year there was a big um, a forest fire that uh, burned uh, over 3,000 acres. And uh, so we're working with the uh, Mount Diablo State Park and the Wildlife Society uh, to use this technology there, and then we'll uh, uh, extend it to other places. It's very, very simple, deceptively simple. We put a sign up where we'd like people to take a picture. We have a little angle bracket on top of the sign, and uh, so we give them very direct instructions on how to place their iPhone or their digital camera in the bracket, take a picture, and upload it. Our Instagram, and then we have software on our website which goes out and collects those and puts them into a slideshow so you can see them one after the other. Uh, this is a, a, a map of where we have our four signs. Uh, and um, so this is one of the first images that we talked about that someone took uh, passing by the sign and uploaded it. This is from uh, mid February. Of course, we have a pretty dry year, and uh, you can see lots of brown. You can see where the fire burned the whole mountainside, basically. Except up on the left hand side, you see above the trail, there's still some green. So that's the trail stopped the fire from going further up. So you can see already. Uh, that we're gathering information about the fire. So here's a picture that we took that was someone took uh, just a few weeks later, and you can see it's already uh, greened up quite a bit. Um, so as we collect data throughout the year and even throughout uh, future years, this will give the biologists and park rangers uh, working on the mountain an incredible amount of data 
uh, for basically no investment. They don't have to have cameras uh, mounted and weatherproof boxes. They don't need wireless networks and antennas. Uh, they just need someone walking by with a cell phone. Uh, in the future, uh, we've already had uh, several folks that have contacted us wanting to do this in other places. And the South Bay have the prescribed fires, which is they burn on purpose to uh, maybe reduce invasive plants, that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, as far as future software development, we just had a really cool uh, day at EcoHack SF uh, a couple of weeks ago, where we um, used some computer vision software to automatically kind of stitch these images together. Right now, we have to go through manually and line them all up. And uh, so over the next few months, we're going to be working to streamline this process so that you can just, so that anyone will be able to use it and uh, use it in their own part, their own uh, situation. And even beyond ecological monitoring, we think this can be used uh, like for public events like Maker Fair. So there are actually three of these signs around the park. So if you see them, please take a picture and upload them and help us monitor the makers. Um, and also construction sites, uh, potential uh, pollution sites, gardens, greenhouses, farms, anywhere where there's change going on over time. This is an awesome technology to uh, capture that change. Uh, uh, another way that we uh, extend open source technology and ideas is to mix and mingle. Uh, well, there's a lot of online resources now and, and uh, forums for uh, folks like us to get together, but there's really nothing like getting folks in the same room at the same time to uh, get the sparks flying and, and get the. Uh, Get the, get the ideas flowing. So, uh, besides our bioblitzes, we uh, have all kinds of uh, public events and uh, mixers and uh, events. We organized a couple of events with the USGS up on their island near Vallejo uh, called Nature Nerd Fest, and uh, we just do all kinds of nerdy stuff. We do uh, uh, remote sensing networks and play with drones and uh, do DNA barcoding experiments and iPhone uh, microscopes and just anybody, anything anybody wants to bring out that's uh, cool toys to play with, uh, figure out nature. Uh, that's what it's all about. Uh, the last one was more focused on drones, and, uh, and we'll talk a little more about drones in a minute, but that's really hot topic. We're uh, doing a lot of exciting work in. So uh, this is the way that we extend community. We have project nights in San Francisco and Oakland every month, so look for us on Meetup. And uh, uh, we also have Google Groups, so uh, look for us there. Uh, I'm going to hand off the mic to uh, a marine scientist in the group, uh, Dr. Andrew Thaler, and he's working on a project called OpenCTD. Uh, thank you, Ken. Um, is this on? Yeah. All right. Uh, so I just want to give you an idea of kind of some of the projects that we've been able to facilitate through this Nerd for Nature group that uh, Ken has helped put together. Um, I'm a marine ecologist by training. I'm a deep sea ecologist. So I spent the better part of the last eight years um, throwing very, very expensive robots into the ocean and hoping they come back. Um, um, so I came into this world kind of sideways because, as a lot of you may know, the state of science funding is um, pretty dismal in the U.S. right now, and so uh, it's becoming less and less practical for me to put out grants to use uh, very, very large capital pieces of equipment to do research. Uh, so when I moved to the Bay Area, I was really looking for uh, innovative new ways to uh, facilitate uh, scientific research uh, using open source uh, maker built tools. Uh, and one of these tools is incredibly important is the CTD. Uh, the CTD is an oceanographic instrument that measures conductivity, temperature, and depth. It basically gives you a profile of a water column that you're working in. And this is absolutely essential to the content of oceanographic research. Uh, every single research expedition I've ever been on has begun and ended with a CTD cast. And many of them rely exclusively on CTD casts to function. Uh, the downside to that is that uh, this guy, this although guy I don't know see, is uh, a full-scale commercial uh, CTD. It costs about sixty thousand uh, dollars. This guy on the left, this little handheld unit, is currently the cheapest commercial unit available that you can use for scientific research. It runs about eight thousand dollars. That is almost my entire annual research grant this time. So I've we've entered a point where it's no longer feasible to use these kinds of tools to do smaller scale oceanographic studies. Uh, so what I did, that slide, is I got together with a team and thought, well, how cheap could we actually make a CTD? Could we make one that could be used by citizen scientists, by um, 
non-institutional scientists, by anyone who really wanted to study the ocean, but lacked access to the tools necessary to do so. Uh, so I had a fairly successful crowdfunding campaign. We got a little bit of startup money to get off the ground, and we put together a plan to build a $200 open source CTD. Um, uh, and at, the point, at this point, uh, uh, there we go. At that point, that was the point where I met the Bay Area, and I met up with Ken and other people from Nerds for Nature, and really began developing this. Uh, Ken helped me work out instrumentation. John gave me ideas for ways to expand on the institution platform to do, and this project is still in development. It's not complete yet. Working towards a $200 CTV, which is a really important tool to galvanize scientific research because of this phenomenon, which is what we like to call the And in the scientific community, anyway, may know that we're in a lot of trouble right now. 10% uh, of scientists who are or work for postdocs, uh, so people who have gotten their PhD, who have gone on to continue with more fellowships, 10% of those people describe themselves as unemployed in 2013. 10%. So these are people who want to do science, who have the skills to do science, but who no longer have access to the resources to do science. So one of the things that I want to do is to galvanize this. They call it, they call it, there's a narrative in the area that says we're losing a generation of scientists. But that's of course not just one. You can obviously see that here. We're not losing a generation of scientists. What we're losing is a generation of scientists. What we're gaining is a generation of freelance scientists, of hobby scientists, of major scientists who need these tools in order to study the world, but don't have access to the full scale of versions. So that's what I'm trying to do is galvanize um, uh, this nascent scientific community of makers, uh, hobbyists, and scientists who want to move on to other careers. Not an intellectual um, uh, resource that we've gained from them by having a Awesome. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, very good. So uh, the last thing I want to talk about is robots for nature. Uh, what do robots have to do with nature, you might say? Well, uh, robots of all sorts of allow us to get things that we just couldn't get to before. They allow us to extend our reach uh, and go places, uh, not only go places that we haven't been before, but to go back to the same place over and over and over and over again. Um, so, um, what is an eco drone? Uh, well, traditional methods have uh, become prohibitive and expensive uh, and dangerous. Uh, typically, uh, for a lot of the things that we're talking about, uh, aerial imaging, uh, they uh, typically uh, traditionally an airplane and uh, of course, they get as low as they'd like to go to get the pictures that they want. It's very expensive. They can't fly at very low altitudes because there are things like uh, radio towers. So, um, uh, however, at the same time, we have a much greater need to monitor all of these ecosystems. So, uh, one type of robot is uh, right out in front of this expo building that you may or may not have seen. And if you haven't, please go check it out. It's called Open ROV, and uh, this is a really awesome little uh, personal submarine you can build. Uh, you can't go down in it, but your camera can. And uh, it's a really awesome way to, um, to go down and look around and uh, experiment with some underwater robots. Uh, we had an Open ROV at our Lake Merritt BioBlitz, and that was really awesome because uh, we let kids and adults, kids of all ages, come up and uh, drive it around in the lake themselves. Uh, and uh, we hope to do more of that sort of thing at, at future events of ours. Um, another uh, type of robot is uh, called a drone or a quadcopter or a UAV. Um, and we have here uh, with us a, a designer and uh, owner of Aerotestra uh, company who uh, designs and manufactures uh, really high quality drones for, um, for uh, it's basically a robotic sensor platform. So, uh, uh, Sean Hedrick? Got your own microphone. Okay, you want that one. Hello, uh, am I on? This is, am I on now? Okay, super. Uh, so, my name is Sean Hedrick, and as Ken said, I've been developing uh, this aerial robotic platform for about the past year. This is known as Hugo. Uh, that's his name. And uh, I got together with Nerds for Nature uh, at the beginning of this year and uh, working together with Ken and Andrew, we 
work to develop a uh, autonomous water sensor platform. So the idea is that we can land at specific GPS locations on a body of water, take sensor readings, uh, pH, temperature, salinity, uh, dissolved oxygen on the surface of the water and log those uh, on a data logger that's on board on a memory card. We can transmit those via Bluetooth to an Android device where we can see those measurements in real time and, um, and then uh, returning to that body of water uh, time after time, day after day, month after month, or year after year, we can, uh, where'd he go? There he is. Um, we can visit those exact same locations. So we have essentially virtual monitoring uh, stations that can exist without there having to be a buoy or uh, some physical um, monitoring station in the water over time. And so there's an idea here where while we can take those um, readings on the surface of the water with the open ROV, we can extend down into the water, uh, taking um, dissolved oxygen and salinity readings down through the water column. But the problem with that is that since you can't transmit that data through water, you have to be tethered to the aircraft or tethered to the the submersible to be able to um, get that data back. And so with Hugo, uh, we've been working with OpenROV with the idea of developing um, a system where we can fly to a specific GPS location, land on the water, and then deploy the ROV or the remotely operated vehicle from, from there, like that. And so we can land at specific GPS locations where we have uh, known terrain that we want to map, um, collect image data or sensor data, and, and from that we can uh, we can create. Let's see. We can create an ortho mosaic. This is of um, of an aerial set of images. So from about um, 100 images flying in a lawnmower pattern over this predetermined area, we can stitch those together into an image. Using that on the water, we could do that same thing with a coral reef or any type of uh, um, topography that would exist under the water, be it a shipwreck or, or something like that. Um, another application where the aerial component of this is is very useful uh, and extends the possibility of using this type of uh, robotic platform to everyone and, and greatly increasing um, their understanding of the environment would be using near-infrared imaging. So most of the, the CMOS cameras or the sensor-based cameras that we have available to us now can see in this near-infrared range. That near-infrared range um, is essentially what's reflected from plants at their uh, determining their level of photosynthetic activity or photosynthesis activity. So um, when a plant is photosynthesizing efficiently, it reflects a great deal of near-infrared and absorbs in the RGB or in the visible spectrum. So just using standard cameras, nothing, uh, nothing like a FLIR or a thermal imaging camera, but a standard camera removes that near infrared filter and replace it with a filter that's been developed by a group uh, known as Public Labs. They do uh, work for citizen scientists. You can develop a platform that can see in this near infrared range. What you see here is the brightest green areas are the most healthy uh, uh, sources of uh, near infrared reflection or the healthiest plants, essentially. Where you can see the slight patches of blue inside of that are diminished uh, near infrared reflection, so that indicates a lower level of photosynthesis activity. And then out around that, what you uh, is actually dormant plants, so that's almost no near infrared reflectance. 
and and uh, and no photosynthesis activity essentially. Um, from the ortho mosaics, uh, since they are taken uh, at relatively low altitude, you have substandard resolution to the uh, to the images and to the actual 3D topography that you can uh, that you can go in and, and perhaps identify uh, plants or topographic changes or even uh, wildlife in some instances. Uh, the first uh, orangutan nests were identified through uh, uh, drones, small unmanned aircraft uh, in Africa, and that's uh, another application. Uh, this is a, a pond in uh, uh, Sunnyvale, California, where we're running successive tests more to show the functionality where over time, days, months, years, uh, you can um, watch change or monitor change. Um, this is essentially showing some of the technology that can be utilized from an aircraft like this. Uh, LIDAR or light uh, laser range finding. Uh, photographs can also be used to, to, in the same sense, to create point file data which can show uh, 3D surfaces or 3D terrain at high resolution. Uh, this was created from a number of uh, images that were collected in uh, Redwood City on the salt marshes there. That sometimes you can see as you approach uh, to the airport there in San Francisco. You can see this is the photo texture 3D mesh. So what the mesh is created, uh, the texture is going to be reapplied at the, the high resolution of those images. Um, these are a few areas where we can use uh, drones, so for um, aerial images to compare and, and monitor change over time, to create just general, uh, video uh, presentations that can show the areas that we're watching, or for very specific areas where you want to monitor change over time, like lakes or waterways or uh, impact of vegetation, that sort of thing. And um, here, here's another area where traditional uses to track uh, the radio telemetry from migrating species that have been tagged uh, is from the ground using directional antennas. Uh, once you can apply that same technology to drones like this, they can be raised into the air and uh, thereby extending the range of your capacity to track these species. And given that you can have one person potentially operate several drones, and even in the future operate completely autonomously, it just extends that, that range for a single person to collect data and, uh, and track species. And like I described, if this, uh, this, this is the dog here that we use in Michigan land, and it's essentially just clicking to place waypoint locations or defining an area and creating an autonomous grid to do that type of survey. And so. Awesome. Well, thanks very much, folks, for, uh, for watching, and uh, be sure to check out our monitor chain signs around the site. And our uh, News for Nature booth is over in the hackerspace section, so please stop by and uh, chat with us. Thank you very much.